Hey there. If you're enjoying the show, please leave us a rating and review on whatever podcast app you're using. It would really help spread the word about the show. Thanks and happy spelling. Hello and welcome to Dispel Magic the podcast where we overthink the impact of magic on the worlds of D&D. I'm Benjamin, game designer and writer. And my name's Dane. I'm a DM, podcaster, and voice actor. And today, we're going to be talking about Teleportation Circle. Ooh. Everybody's favorite final piece to their headquarter crown. Everybody wants one. Everybody needs one. I, I don't know if I've ever actually been in a campaign where a permanent teleportation circle was achieved. It's a really, really big commitment to get a teleportation circle. But yeah, of course, it's something everybody kind of imagines or or hopes they'll get to in a campaign that they'll build up some kind of fortress mm -hmm. or that they're the city they take over, they're going to put a teleportation circle in it so they can just kind of head home whenever they want. Yeah. I'm really excited to be doing this episode because this spell is actually the spell that gave me the idea for the podcast. Oh, cool. Yeah. When I saw this spell, as I was rereading the books for like the millionth time, I just thought how much this change would change the world. And, and actually my own homebrew campaign setting was heavily informed by reading the spell and thinking about how it would impact the world just expanding it what it means to have a teleportation circle for realsies right and even though i thought i had really thought through the implications of the teleportation circle when i created my setting when i was preparing for this episode i will say i found some truly incredible some might say horrific and well yes it's truly really incredible and horrific ways the teleportation circle could be used so uh, and none of them have to do with deadly neurotoxin uh, hmm. Hmm. hmm here i'm gonna read about the uh, teleportation yeah, circle tell, tell us all about it tell you all about it the teleportation circle is a fifth level conjuration spell available to bards sorcerers and wizards it takes a minute to cast has a range of 10 feet requires 50 gold pieces of chalk and ink, which the spell consumes, and its duration is one round. Specifically, the spell text says, as you cast the spell, you draw a 10-foot diameter circle on the ground inscribed with the sigils that link your location to a permanent teleportation circle of your choice, whose sigil sequence you know, and that is on the same plane of existence as you. A shimmering portal opens within the circle you drew and remains open until the end of your next turn. Any creature that enters the portal instantly appears within five feet of the destination circle or in the nearest unoccupied space if that space is occupied. And that's something we're going to dig into specifically later because that's a really interesting little quirk. Many major temples, guilds, and other important places have permanent teleportation circles inscribed somewhere within their confines. Each such circle includes a unique sigil sequence, a string of magical runes arranged in a particular pattern. When you first gain the ability to cast this spell, you learn the sigil sequence for two destinations on the material plane determined by the GM. You can learn additional sigil sequences during your adventure you can commit a new sigil sequence to memory after studying it for one minute you can create a permanent teleportation circle by casting the spell in the same location every day for one year you need not use this circle to teleport when you cast the spell in this way whoo yeah that is a, that's a chunk that's a chunk that's a chunk the, the right off the bat, the very first thing that jumps out to me about the spell is that in, in an earlier episode, I think in, in the very first episode, we talk about what the wizard class implies, that it implies mm -hmm. that there's a structure, a magical kind of social structure to the world of D&D. Where, where, where wizards come from. Yeah. 
this spell does not imply an existing structure. It tells you it yeah. is an existing structure. Major temples, guilds, right. other yeah. important places. Right. To my mind, this sounds like you can probably find multiple teleportation circles in major cities. Mm-hmm. Like this isn't each major city has one. This is several kind of places of import within mm-hmm. a city have their own teleportation circles the university the major temple probably the uh, the leader of the city and the main castle that kind of thing right which brings us back to another thing that we talk about in in that very first episode which is how common are spell casters Mm -hmm. so in order for major temples guilds and other important places to have these that means there has to be some significant amount of ninth level spellcasters running around willing and able to spend an entire year casting the spell in the exact same place every single day yeah that's insane right <laughs> that's, right. that's wild to think about right right because because we've been talking kind of small potatoes so far of like First level spells, second level spells, cantrips, cantrips, all that. But this is saying there are enough people who can cast fifth level spells that there's kind of part of the infrastructure of cities is, is built by them. Right. And that requires so much study and that retires so much cost and even just 50 gold worth of chalk. They've got to, you know, that has to be supplied by someone. Right. Yeah. So it's so assuming that when that the that year means an earth year, Mm -hmm. which is 365 days, 365 days, very standard, very rememberable. 18,250 gold pieces just in chalks and inks. (laughs) <laughs> that somebody's going to be dedicating to to building one of these yeah. and that and that's to say nothing of what it would cost to keep a, a spellcaster of that level stationary mm-hmm. like you imagine that once somebody's a ninth level spellcaster they've probably gone out and slain some dragons or something equivalent they want to probably mix it up they want to acqui- get out there acquired some treasure hoards so you have to do like something to to get them to want to stay in one place for a whole year while they just cast the spell every single day for you. Like blackmail. You got to blackmail them into it. I mean, I, that would be one way of doing it, I guess. But I'm also thinking that 18,250 that it's going to require in raw materials probably pales in comparison to whatever you're paying this spellcaster to show up to his, it's not really nice. It's not really a nine to five. It's like a nine to nine oh one. Yeah. Uh, but Takes still, ten, ten minutes. I'm yeah. out. Give me my gold. But, but still, they have to hang out in this one city for a year now, instead of whatever they were up to. Okay, so, so let's say a, a giant city is right. is in need of some teleportation circles. We're thinking maybe four of these high level wizards, maybe like two ninth level and one tenth level something like that to spread this around like these are specialized people so that's the thing is that in addition to the fact that many majors many major temples guilds and other important places have them these teleportation circles are useless unless you have a ninth level spell caster Mm -hmm. to cast the spell again so it this this so while it explicitly states that there are enough ninth level spellcasters to create these teleportation circles. It also implies that there's enough ninth level spellcasters to make having them worthwhile. That's a tremendous investment of gold to never get to use it. So, yeah. <laughs> so we ha- so we have to imagine that there's this whole other set of wizards and yeah. spellcasters that are on retainer who are on retainer to just cast it cast it for you to get you back to it's, so it's bards sorcerers and wizards right so bards are probably playing their musics all around and and they're they're probably hanging out in a city like if they're not traveling bards and they and they've got like a following in the city right if they're a rock star what i think is interesting is that there's no clerics and these these circles can be found in temples. So right. the religious institutions themselves have to go outside of their walls because it, it makes sense that a, a wizarding college would have something like this. And it makes sense that a, a, a 
whatever uh, leader, monarch, whatever would have a castle wizard to on on retainer just anyway for various things but these these temples hmm well that's i think where we can we can some of the baggage we bring to D D is thinking mm. is thinking of campaign settings in this very video game way right. of am i joining the mages college or the thieves guild or the cleric temple or whatever but of course there are probably like really pious wizards you know true like there's no, probably, very good there's probably for any god there's probably a spellcaster or two who studies arcane magic but is very devout in their own way and right. would love to give to the temple in in this way so there's a couple things that then the teleportation circles being both common in major cities and also paired with the implication that there's enough wizards go around to to use the teleportation circles to make mm -hmm. use of that network so the first thing i think of is this must mean wealthy people primarily travel via teleportation circles mm -hmm. they just pop 50 gold in the wizard machine and and get flung to some distant locale Right. Like, why would you ever hire a, like a boat to take you somewhere when like you could die? Narratively, I mean, they're uh, like, like, I don't trust those <laughs> teleportation circles. Put me on the boat. Right. Like a teleport. Like there's no role to see if if somehow the teleportation circle messes up and you just like mm -hmm. die or meld with a wall or something. It's it always works perfectly. Right. So so it's a no risk. 50 gold pieces and you're there instantaneously versus oh i'll i'll buy a boat i'll staff the boat i'll take several months sailing i'll like hire i'll, I'll pay for all the the food Crew and everything and the, else yeah, yeah that would require me to get there or you know just my family and i will walk through a portal and be in the place that we want to go yeah I, and I mean, six seconds isn't a long time, but you can you can get quite a few folks through there in six seconds. And what's your standard adventuring party? Five five people. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no limit to the number of people who can go through it. So it's really just how many people can you pack around mm -hmm. when you cast the spell. So it's also definitely a situation where you could do discount rates if you've got multiple <laughs> people. Like if there's like a, a Hawaii of your setting, like a, a big destination spot, mm -hmm. probably it's easier or cheaper to get there because lots of people are paying. And it's like, it's not even as much trouble as a, as a airport. You just have to like be willing to stand really close to a bunch of other people and I'll rush the portal when it opens. Well, first you get cast detect disease. And then, right. and yeah. then you go through the portal. Right. So I, I guess I can see just a really quirky wizard travel agency that have, have done this themselves, right? An organization yeah. that have, have done this themselves and, and they've got all of these spots available to you. I and they're charging a premium. <laughs> yeah. This is a service that I think is so exclusive that it, it wouldn't make sense for it to be under the umbrella of a merchant guild or anything mm -hmm. else. I do think this, this spell makes the case for mages having their own guild or union mm -hmm. around operating this, which leads me into another thing that it makes me think of, which is that having a teleportation circle at your home or business or whatever else is probably a status symbol oh yeah in in a feather a in your world. cap right like like my place is important enough that people need to be able to come here as quickly as possible <laughs> yeah at a moment's notice like i can imagine that something nobles kind of compete over is you know who's got a teleportation circle and who doesn't who travels yeah exactly there's probably an in keep what is it keeping up with the joneses yeah that's the that is the uh there's probably, some, there's, probably, yeah. there's probably some keeping up with the joneses around knowing who has a teleportation circle i imagine that like once it's done 
everybody uses it once or twice mm-hmm. and then nobody uses it for a long time because like a Norda track right or anything else that rich people do <laughs> i wouldn't even know right i wouldn't know either I, but... neither of us right. have a gold piece to our name right yeah. <laughs> well, and, and you, you're talking about here in your notes about how the nefarious side of things where thieves guilds are like trying to scout out what the these rich folks teleportation circles are so that they can get in there. Right. So. If so, in if, if everything follows here and it's true that rich people are primarily using teleportation circles to move around and that it it's a bit of a status symbol to have one then it makes sense that thieves guilds might want to get in there want to acquire those sigil sequences so they can either assassinate people or rob them how hard do you think it is to change your sigil i think it's impossible yeah i think that once you i mean once it's cast once it's i mean once it's built once you spent that entire year and all that uh, money building it i think you've got the sigil sequence you've got literally set in stone right so does that mean once your sigil identity has been thefted you're just kind of boned right which which i think then gives rise to this idea that i mean like and we're kind of going multiple steps deep on, yeah well on that's how what we do effect. here yeah. man we got but it like but we're digging this I, hole. I, what I think ultimately that comes to is that then nobles are probably building dungeons, yeah, dungeon complexes around their their around their teleportation circles, like as as a kind of like they want people to be able to jump in. So probably there's like a pool right when you get there, and a bar, a mini bar or a bar, some other niceties, yeah. But then if you actually try to get to where they live from that teleportation circle. There's probably a whole dungeon, like, I mean, staffed with like monsters and traps and everything else. Being a noble which is, sounds exhausting. I, I, honestly, this makes me think nobles are cooler than I would have <laughs> thought of before. It's also like, I've got never, their own mini dungeon. <laughs> exactly. Their own, their own micro dungeons. Like you can imagine that that even lends more to like the kind of like hipster Mm-hmm. Like who's like who's who's well, i got a manatar what exactly you got exactly right like then not only do you do you measure your dicks against the te- who's got a teleportation circle and who doesn't that's also like yeah well i actually was able to acquire a red dragon wormling and in 100 years no one is going to be able to get into my house yeah good luck with your gelatinous cube noob get out of here right yeah like, I, I really love this idea. And I also, it really makes me want to campaign in this world that's like all about r- like heists and yeah. competing nobles. Yeah, just and competing high nobles stakes. where it's like getting into each other's dungeons and getting out of each other's dungeons. And well, it, it kind of sounds like, and, and they're probably trying to, if, if the competition is this high, they're trying to, what's the word? They're trying to like bring down the other people, right? to to be on top so there's like a competition element with that too where they're like well i'm gonna ruin your shit so that my shit's better yeah oh you had a cave and that's so oh that's awful oh yeah you can't imagine that like maybe nobles hire adventuring parties just to Mm -hmm. go fuck up other people's teleportation circle dungeon things (laughs) which is awesome that's that sounds so like fun. that sounds like a great campaign. Yeah, 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 yeah. Keeping up with the Joneses, but like deadly. <laughs> yes. Right. I, I it, what made me think have have we explored or have you explored at all rather what happens halfway through? Like do you just touch it and you're through or can you be halfway through and it cut off? Nothing in this spell suggests that things could be cut off. Okay. It suggests That's that too bad. you, you, I mean, you know, it's you touch it's, the portal, you're through, right? It's really up to interpretation. I, I don't, but I don't see anything in the, in the spell text that implies to me that you could be partially through it and it could close or whatever, and then cut in half. Or mm-hmm. But then that's, that's DM flavor that can, uh, right. I mean, thrown in there. I mean, that's something where every, every table is going to have to interpret exactly how this works for themselves. And, and pretty soon 
we're going to get going to get into some some conversations that will really rely on how you choose to interpret the spell and how you choose to interpret the word instantaneous right and and all that any Um, creature that enters the portal instantly appears within five feet so it sounds like it's more star trek right except for that even in star trek i feel like when they when they beam up there's always that like few moments of like oh is it gonna work right like right like there's not like this which is just pop yeah it just works that's that that's something that you can explore as a dm to to really liven things up if yeah. if you have prevalent teleportation circles then throwing in a little bit of tension in there and might be a little might be more fun so two other things i i want to touch on before we get into the more esoteric stuff mm. the the first is that the proliferation of teleportation circles also changes how war might occur between different different cities and settlements because obviously the the probably easiest way to invade is just to learn the sigil sequences of those teleportation circles or the teleportation circles within the city and just port your whole army into the middle of the city like all of a sudden so that might end up ultimately leading back to this idea that like teleportation circles within cities are always surrounded by like dungeons, but, but that's just, but, but I just want to throw that out there as an, as an interesting explore, an interesting way to explore teleportation circles is that how, how it might get used in warfare. But then the other thing is if rich people are all using teleportation circles, who is building roads? Right. What is the purpose of roads in a D&D world? Well, as we've said before, the, the smaller townships, the, the settlements and things like that, they do need a way to get around. Well, they, yeah. I mean, like, so I can imagine they'd have dirt roads. Dirt roads like, is probably the best you're going to do. Right. Because wealthy people don't need to travel by roads. And you know, they can probably send a caravan through the teleportation circle. So most of the time, simpler, safer, more effective to just send goods through this teleportation mm-hmm. circle than to actually send them via trade routes. So that I think is, 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 is difficult to totally picture like a world without roads or trade routes Back to the future. But, <laughs> where right, we're going, yeah, we don't right, need exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, I guess that's probably what he meant. Yeah, it's the. I, I think the future probably has teleportation. What he was talking about, yeah. What he was talking future, about was a world sure. where. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's. Ask I guess that, answer. Yeah. They're done. <laughs> All right. No more questions about that. <laughs> so no, I, I think that that poor folk would have to do for their own. I think that the number of lower class citizens in a stratified system like this, you know, I I think that if they're paying tax to the crown, then they expect a certain amount of necessities to be met. Right. And one of those is some safer form of conveyance between places. So if they're a benevolent ruler, then a little more manicured, hard packed roads, probably not cobblestone, probably not upkept, but you know, and then if you're really shitty, you're like, here's a trail, get, get, get there. I don't give a shit. I can also picture that maybe there's like a God of roads in a setting where maybe roads are old fashioned mm. and wealthy people don't use them, but out of, uh, loyalty to that god they Mm. still they still build and maintain roads as kind of like a ritual component right we we do it because we always have done it right because in in the before times before the teleportation circles that's how we had to get around we're honoring our ancestors who had to walk places let's get into the weird stuff yeah Benjamin, Let's get into the weird stuff. Can we get okay. into the weird stuff, please? Because there's some real weird stuff you can do with portals. We can get into the weird stuff. 
when I was thinking about the weird stuff you could do, I, w- I was talking with some friends and the first thing that we started talking about was how instantaneous travel between different points might allow for time travel. Now, you've already blown my mind. I want to put a pin in that because I don't understand it at all. Mm-hmm. And I hope that at some point we can find somebody smart enough to come on to the show and talk about how instantaneous teleportation allows for time travel. But I'm not that guy. And, I'm not that guy either. And I don't know if and, you've noticed. And, and honestly, I've talked to people. So I've had plenty of people who I think are smarter than me disagree about exactly what it would mean. Okay. And then also none of them can explain it to me in a way where I even understand what they're talking about. So, so for now, we're just so, going to put, I'm just going to say, I think, I think the spell lets you time travel. Okay. And, and listeners, if you have anybody who you think could do this in an entertaining way, then uh, let us know on our Twitter at dispel magic pod, because we, uh, we want to explore this space and time, but, but, while I, am, while I am not smart enough to figure out how instantaneous travel across long distances allows for time travel, what I was able to think of or figure out was a what I call the infinite hell loop. And that's capitalized with a little TM next yeah. to it. This is copyright Sterling Vermin Industries to ask your friends, get it installed. That's right. Tell us about the infinite hell loop. Okay. Or the IHL. Okay. So the IHL is actually really simple in terms of how execution. Okay. It's not complex to figure out or to set up. So to create an infinite hell loop, the first thing you need is a teleportation circle. So we know already that that's a big cost and a big investment. I've heard of those. But let's say you either find one or you desire to make an infinite hell loop. And so you, you build one. Okay, so I've got my teleportation circle. So the spell says that you either that you show up in an unoccupied space within five feet of the teleportation circle, circle mm-hmm. that you're trying to get sent to, right? Okay. So so around the teleportation circle, you you build a wall so that there's only one possible space a person's going to get shunted to whenever they cast it, whenever you cast it, right? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense so far? I, I'm there with you. Okay. All right. So then you get directly beneath that space and you cast it and you throw whoever you're trying to punish into the gate. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the teleportation circle is like feet away from you, but you're casting the spell to send them to it. And they're automatically getting kind of dumped out directly above where the the next one is. Yes. Right the portal that you cast it to send them in the first place. So the spell only lasts for six seconds, right? It's only a round, but, but from their perspective, they are falling. And depending upon the falling speed, you fall an infinite distance, basically Mm -hmm. in in Xanathar's, they limit it to 500 feet, which is still for this purpose is going to really mess you up. But what, regardless of what it is, you get, you cast the spell you get thrown out of the teleportation circle. You drop back into the gate that then sends you back to the teleportation circle. And the, according to just the player's handbook, where you have an infinite fall rate, you do this an infinite number of times, all within six seconds. So what I'm what I'm imagining here is two slabs of stone that are about a foot away from each other. On the upper slab of stone, there is a teleportation circle. On the bottom slab of stone, there is a teleportation circle. You put this person in between these two slabs and activate both circles at the same time. And then it's just... Yeah, if you've ever played Portal, then this is like a trick you have to use in that game where you build up momentum by shooting a portal above you and a portal below you, and you're just falling, 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 falling. And then you shoot another portal somewhere else and you kind of get launched out. Velocity is conserved, I think they said. I don't know what that means. In this case, though, you're falling an infinite amount of times. Like there's no no stopping the falling. You're just perpetually falling 
to every other observer, only six seconds pass. But to you. <laughs> but to you, you've, you're falling through these portals an infinite number of times. I, I don't. You'd go mad. You would go mad. It's Event Horizon. I mean, I mean, I guess You're Sam Neil, you don't have eyes anymore. I, I don't truly even understand what this means in terms of like, would you age to death? You might age or, or start or starve death. I don't think so because only six cents, six seconds is happening, but mentally in, in an objective sense. But yeah, I guess from like a sensory perspective, you're, you're, you're there. You're, you have no input. I don't know exactly what happens in the infinite hell loop. I'm just telling you that's how it works <laughs> that I built it in my mind. Yeah. And it's bad and yes. it's not fun to do. Right. I, it's not a ride to take. I think at, by the end of, of at some point, we need to build a spell theme park. All of these things, like, you know, we, we go through each, each spell that we've we've discussed and we come up with a, a ride of some sort. Yeah. This one, be, would, yeah. this one would be the longest six seconds of your life. <laughs> everyone comes out completely crackers yeah you know you've you've seen both your birth and death you've seen the end of time you've seen the start of time and it's the same what you just said reminded me that one other consequence of the infinite hell loop mm. that i'm barely smart enough to understand you're just scraping the circuit yeah, just of. scraping the surface of, as I, I think because you're generating a kind of infinite velocity situation, I think you're also capable of producing an infinite amount of energy. Oh, shit. Right? Because you've got an object falling kind of. So you put a magnet infinite... in there and you get an electro, you get a bunch of wires around that. That's a giant shock of power. I, yeah, I think, I mean, like, Something I don't like know. That. I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know. I just think that like if you drop yeah. that there's that there's something you could run through physicists this, get at through us electrical engineers get at right. us tell that us would, what we're talking about that would let you essentially create a stable did infinite just, power source did we just uh, create fission is that fission i've heard I, great things about fission i don't, I don't i'm not smart dane I don't i'm know. not smart either we know a couple of nuclear engineers we should ask them yeah, we know smart people, but we we're not smart, smart people. people. We're not smart people. Well, I think that'll probably do it for this episode of Dispel Magic. I we've left off on a real disconcerting note with the with the IHL, and and I think I'd like to hear what our listeners think of that. So you can you can tweet us at Dispel Magic Pod on Twitter. Tell us what you think. What what kind of crazy teleportation things have you come up with? You can find me on Twitter at Dane in Danger. Benjamin, where can they find you? And you can find me at Sterling Berman. Thanks for listening to Dispel Magic. We hope you enjoy, and we'll see you after your next long rest. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Dispel Magic. If this has inspired any ideas for your game, or you have another take on today's topic, please let us know on Twitter at Dispel Magic Pod. You can find Benjamin at Sterling Vermin and Dane at Dane in Danger. Thank you to Slim Mittens for our cover art, produced by Benjamin Huffman, produced and edited by Dane Fox McGraw.